Yeah, I disagree with you. I, I think okay. that this is bad information and bad magic play, and we should not be promoting that type of terrible resource management. All right, well, we might edit <laughs> all this shit, but whatever. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome back. back to the Colors of Crutch podcast. My name is Max Sternberg, also known as Wounded Satellite, and I'm joined today by hopefully feeling much better, Max P, the Florian man. How you doing today, Max? How you feeling? Yeah, I'm mostly better. Still a little bit sick, but you know, you know. Same. All right, we're getting there. We're getting there. I just have a giant booger in my throat. Other than that, I'm fine. Yeah. The congestion. Yeah. This is the perfect. This is the perfect level of sickness, though, to sound like a Jewish man. <laughs> a smoke. A Ford uh, who smoked Newports for twenty five years. Exactly. I like you a know? smoker. <laughs> exactly what I feel like. Exactly. What I feel like. So, but no, it's good. Hello. How was your weekend? Weekend was. It was good. It was all right. You know, chasing the kids around. Nothing. Nothing crazy. Nothing crazy. Always. Yeah. yeah. Um. Next weekend, I'm planning a, a little tournament. Uh, like thirty two person thing. Just, Nice. It'll be fun. I should be able to, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be cut to top ten this time, which is better than top sixteen for that small. Yeah, top sixteen for like a thirty person event is a little a little wild. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> especially with it's crazy to even look at that that like dual land event that Ian won this past weekend. Like people at seven points made top sixteen. It's crazy. It's kind of been the trend lately. Actually, is a lot of tournaments have kind of shrunk. There's more tournaments, but they're smaller. I've seen a lot of these mm-hmm. like forty, fifty. You know, falling just short of that sixty-person, you know, number, all over the place. Mm-hmm. All right, you you, yeah. you played in one. Definitely. You played in one this weekend, right? Out. Yeah, F- fifty-five people. Yeah. <laughs> that seems to be the new the new size right now. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's a little weird if you look at the online events. They've definitely been been shrinking, and that's I mean a, a huge part of what kind of kept me off of playing in chaos this past weekend was when I was looking the night before to sign up. It had high thirties in the entries. And I was like, "Wow, high high thirties. That almost isn't worth it." Which is which was weird. As like the defending champion of that series, I kind of wanted to run it back, but I don't know. So few people. I was like, "It's, it's the payoff's going to be super super small." It's kind of weird to just cut something like that to top sixteen. Feels like I don't know. You don't even need that many rounds. It just seemed a little off. Um, so it ended up I got hit up by a guy when I was thinking about all of this at like eleven thirty at night, and he was like, "Are you coming to the?" The tournament at level seven tomorrow and i was like didn't even know it was happening but it was a 1k with over 50 signups i was like sick okay that sounds great actually yeah um yeah how'd you do so i went to that instead uh top four very nice very <laughs> nice very nice <laughs> well, we'll 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 go through the rounds yeah. for that one it was actually very very interesting i had a lot of really really cool games uh Timujin was at this event as well uh we got to battle it out in round one <laughs> which was hilarious you know it, we were randomly paired immediately it, it's almost like to me it feels like cdh has kind of entered the friday night magic phase. you know where <clears throat> these tournaments feel you know more like friday night magic where you go to friday night magic and you play a standard event or a modern event and play several rounds and see how you do yeah. like it, it doesn't feel but it, like huge tournaments as much as it as it did for a while there um right but at the same time they're all on saturday and they are still like 12 hour events if you go through the whole thing okay uh so well, why don't we you know we're gonna jump into your rounds we're gonna talk through your rounds and then afterwards we're gonna talk about how to beat in it and how to beat blue farm yeah the menaces of the format yeah the decks that some people say we need to arrange an accident for yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with that idea i agree with it Absolutely. There's a lot. Of, dude, there's been so many Kinnon players in every event I've played lately. I mean, Fishbowl was all, all my rounds were double Kinnon, and uh, this this tournament was not super different. There was a, there was a lot of Kinnons there. Yeah, you know, there was a lot of. Kinnons you know, it's interesting. There. I'm not seeing Kinnon in practice. Like none of the people I practice with are playing Kinnon. None of them. But you go to a tournament because you don't practice with me. Yeah, uh, right. I guess. <laughs> but like I, I, you know, I practice with a lot of really good players, and none of them are on Kinnon right now. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, that you go to a tournament and everyone's on it. Uh, maybe I'm just on the yep. like in the wrong places, practicing in the wrong, and secretly playing Kinnon. Yeah, which I think what was it? Uh, Rami, who's a Kinnon mm-hmm. player, said I think he was he was at the event. Uh, I think it was in the Carolinas or something for the for the dual lands, and he said he was like the only Kinnon he saw. Okay. So maybe oh, I don't know. Maybe Kinnon is not as big an enemy as we think it is. Uh. Uh, where I am, it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder so whose many. fault that is. There's so so many. Yeah, right. Yeah. So anyway, all right. So 
Before we get into the rounds, one last thing. As always, we are sponsored by TopDeck.gg. Welcome to TopDeck.gg, the greatest tournament software in the whole world. Whether you're running an event, playing for the biggest prize, or want to advertise your shop to thousands of players around, we have the software for you. With our amazing intuitive pairing, we make playing magic an absolute breeze. All of your customers, all your participants, they can check their standings in real time. They're right there for them. They can see their pairings, they can see their results, and they can submit their round without having to turn in any of those crappy paper slips. If you want to play Magic the best way, if you want to use the best software there is, you better go to topdeck.gg. A uh, quick update in terms of the playmats. Uh, they should be delivered you know, should be delivered today, today uh, to, to Max over here. And then the next step of the process is we got to get the right size tubes uh, to use to ship them out. So we're going to do the measurements, order the tubes, start shipping them out. So pretty exciting. Yep, shouldn't shouldn't be long. Which I'm I'm a big fan of transparency. Uh, they were supposed to be delivered like three or four days ago, and Colorado had a wild snowstorm. Um, I'm from Boston, and this was some of the most snow I've ever seen in one day. It, we got about three full feet, and not only was it three full feet, where for Colorado you expect more of the fluffy powder type snow that's pretty easy to get rid of. This was thick, wet heavy snow it was back breaking to, to shovel and absolutely miserable and the driving conditions were atrocious so i live on a small side street that the plows were not able to get to efficiently so my street was just undeliverable for a few days uh, but they should be arriving today like i haven't i checked an hour ago they weren't here yet but they should be here today and then i'm gonna immediately do measurements order the tubes and then we'll start getting getting everything going if you yeah, yeah. if you enjoy if you enjoy us don't forget to like and subscribe this video if you want to support us even more, we have a Patreon. You can sign up there. If you want to join the Discord, join the out, out of the YouTube video conversations. You can find that also in the description below. And if you're interested in CDH coaching, I got you. Hit me up. Discord wound satellite, Twitter wound satellite. Easy, quick, breezy. Nice, nice. So tell us about the tournament you played in. And let's let's talk some uh, talk some gameplay, man. So yeah, tournament was a. It ended up being I think 55 total people. Um, it was called like the Legendary Trials Three or something. It was over at level seven on the northern half of Denver. They have a few locations. Uh, pretty nice space. I went with Suki. Uh, me and Suki rocked our matching sweatshirts for this event, as as we like to. We always always the correct vibe. People I knew at this event it was going to have Pigeon from over at Chaos. It was going to have Temujin. Um, a few of the other people I've like known from around Denver and gotten to meet. And don't worry, I'll mute that. You done? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you done? Probably not, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but we, we, we get there in the morning. I've got my monster energy with me. I'm getting ready to play. And and I wasn't sure what I was going to be playing. Uh, I had a Twitter poll from this past weekend where I said, what do you guys what do you guys want me to play this weekend? And the options were Kin and Obnixilis and Talion. Three options, where of course then the average would be 33.3%. They finished at 32, 33, and 34% with votes respectively. So... I called that a tie <laughs> and said, I don't care. I'm going to play what I want. <laughs> uh, so it was, <laughs> that's, that's a tie. Sure, so I was sure. going to, mentally, I was going to play Talion and, and I went to this event because chaos is 90 minute rounds for treasure series, which is perfect for Talion. Like absolutely perfect. And I go to this event. I'm like, how long are the rounds? They say 80 minutes. Like, oh, cool. I'm not playing Talion. <laughs> so, so I decided to bring back Kinnon again. Um, and yeah, went went super well. Deck felt fantastic per usual. My round one to get into it was Temujin on the play, immediately just randomly paired against him. A Tivit player whose name I do not know in second seat. Uh, we had a guy who said it was his first ever event. Really fun guy to meet, Deshaun in third seat, also on Kinnon. I'm um, a little more proactive version of the deck overall. And then myself uh, coming up the rear in fourth seat. They all snap kept for seven. I said, great, <laughs> ended up mulling kind of low and kept a hand that was just a turn one Manglehorn. And I was like, cool, let's hope this gets this pod to a draw. Uh, that was my entire plan there. And so I, fourth seat, come up the rear. I'm like, I'm not winning this one, but that's fine. Uh, slammed the turn one Manglehorn, definitely had a, a huge effect on the game. By the way, Temujin on the play was on Atali. He was not on Tibet. He was not on uh, Thrasios Francisco. He was on Atali, just go fun, figure it out. Uh, deck is gas. I love Atali. I'm a big Atali fan. 
And yeah, he he kept a hand that was certainly going to be a turn to Atali with the mana production, but my Manglehorn screwed that up a little bit. Uh, ended up where the other Kinnon player ended up imposter mecking my Manglehorn as well. So we're kind of dealing with each other's things, and and I've just got like nothing going on this whole game. I like played out of Bloom Thunder, and I'm just chilling. Finally, on turn turn three or turn four, Tamujin, I think it was turn four, he finally casts Atali, and this dude immediately hits Con Sphinx off the other Kinnon player. We're like, fuck, <laughs> that's not <laughs> that's not good. Uh, so the game kind of divulges over the next, you know, whatever it was, 40, 50 minutes at this point to really just like Tamuja not quite being able to win, but being in an incredibly dominant position and us knowing that Tivit could win, but probably can't win because we need to have our interaction for Tamuja and kind of that awkward phase. And the really interesting play at the end of this game was... We ended up getting... We so so Temusha ends up going through most of his library because he casts a Wheel of Fortune when he has the Consmix out. So we all draw new hands of seven and Temusha draws 40, 49 cards, which is which is great. And you, you would hope you could win from that, right? His Dockside, Food Chain, Al Sora Shepherd, all the really important cards to make it happen were all in like the bottom five cards of his library, <coughs> which kind of screwed him a little bit mm -hmm. for a while. Um, he ends up finding the food chain, but when we, when we go into Temujin's final turn, where the turn before, he's also like, he's he's beating people down with damage. You know, Tivit is almost dead. Me and the other Kinnon player can like maybe survive. So it was on Temujin's final turn, when he's untapping with, uh, so he did the 42 cards, couldn't win in that turn, had to do the turn cycle around. So we're on what is now going to be the final turn of the game, time-wise as well. Like the clock is running out. And... I have a ton of interaction. Me and the other Kinnon player are like revealed interaction to each other at this point to be able to play around things correctly because we're just trying to go for the draw. And the Tibbet player, we know has a removal spell because I guess he just like flashed his hand enough to Tamush. Which again, always gotta be careful in person about not just revealing your cards. And Tamujin goes to swing at him with lethal, which includes a Ragavan, a Tali, a Hellkite Courser, just like a bunch of things. And, and I tell him, I say, just die. Don't remove anything. He's trying, like, for one, he's trying to bait you to remove the Atali. But, like, don't do it. Like, just, just die. Don't give him any additional outs. At this point, Temujin has two cards left in his library. And the Tibbet player goes, I'm going to take the path that at least keeps me alive. And just decides to swords the Hellkite Courser. Mm -hmm. And so that means Ragavan connects. And he survives. And Tibbet flips off the top of his library. Thassa's Oracle. So now we have an additional win condition that we have to play around. And I was like, just just die, bro. <laughs> like, we're at time. <laughs> yeah, what he what we ended up finding out is he didn't know that you still got the point for the draw if you died. So that was what was he he was newer to the tournament scene as well. So like it makes sense. Um and he said, Yeah, I probably would have just died otherwise. Um, but very unfortunate that you know, flips exactly Thassa's Oracle with two cards in library. And so then we have to go through the process of fighting through Food Chain and a few other win conditions and Dockside and some things with all of our interaction first. And then finally, Temujin casts the Thassa's Oracle. I have to use my final piece of interaction on it, which is a Mind Break Trap. And then he is able to play his Teamer Sabretooth, which allows him to win the game uh, because he has his Dockside. And I asked him after the game, I said, if you didn't have that Thassa's Oracle, does my Mind Break Trap stop you? And he goes, 100% would have been a draw. <laughs> like, like, so he gets the win there. Um, and that was my round one. Quick, quick, not quick loss, but it was a it was a loss, but it was a fun game. You know, uh, a lot of politics, really, really good overall play. Always love playing against Demusion. Um, round two was one of the freest wins I've ever gotten. I was on the play. I was against, I don't even honestly remember know what these decks were. There was a Magna in the pod. I think there was a something. I don't know. This was, I, I kept a hand that literally, it was a hand that if I drew a land in the first two draws was just a clean turn two win. Hmm. It was like, five, it was five mana on turn one with Kinnon out, Tezzeret crop rotation in hand. Nice. And so I was just like, okay, I, I I just need to draw any land in these first two draws, and I and I win on turn two. And I was on the play, so I was like, this is you snap keep that hand. Uh, so I draw for my first two turns. I do not hit a land, um, but I do hit a trophy mage and a flesh duplicate in my first two draws. So I end up on turn two, just deciding to tap one of my mana rocks to play flesh duplicate as a copy of an elf that someone had, which gives me more mana for the turn three win, and also isn't really telegraphed at all because it also put me from five to seven mana so it looks like i'm just trying to go for cannon activations right. as well and then i untap on turn three i was like cool tesseract got anything nope trophy mage got it ggs yeah. no one had shit going into round three it was uh I'm, i believe i was in third seat 
it was a bit of a more proactive pod. Uh, we had Kenrith on the play, who I quickly found out was definitely the more Nas Underworld Breach version of Kenrith. We had, I think it was Najila going second. It was definitely a proactive deck. If it wasn't Najila, it was something very similar. Myself going third, and then Rog Sai on the rear going fourth. So I do not feel like I'm in a great <laughs> position in this pod. This is a lot of proactive players. What ends up happening in this game is I think I think I was able to land like a Ristic study on the earlier side of this game and really just go into control mode, uh, interact with the things that needed to be interacted with. This one was cool. This this Rogsai deck was surprisingly on Shieldred. Mm. And I was set up where I was drawing cards off. I believe it was the One Ring and Ristic Study were my two card advantage engines. And so I was starting to get a little bit low on life to the point where I ended up tutoring. And, and, and Kenrith had Gilded Drake to my Kinnon. And I was like, okay. And I ended up tutoring for what was going to be a clone. And then I was like, honestly? I was going to clone the Shieldred, but I think it's better if I try and gain life here. So I tutored for my own Gilded Drake and took his Shieldred. And took the took took the other guy's shoulder, and I was like, "This is great." And then I started just drawing a ton, you know happily drawn on every Ristic and One Ring draw now, gaining a ton of life while everyone else was being slowly drained out, and they got into really really precarious positions. And I just had so much card advantage that I was able to stop all their win attempts. That was kind of how that game went, and then went to a generic. I don't remember exactly how I won um, that game. Yeah, that was that was a weird one. <laughs> Sorry, I can't be more detailed on that one. But yeah, that that pod I remember the the Kenrith player seemed a little bit upset at the end of the game uh because just how the politics had gone where early on i was just like i can't win i'm not doing anything i'm just trying to control and then you know we hit that over the, the over the edge point, point where then yeah. i became I, I eventually became the problem going into round four this was a pod that i expected to be a draw the second that i looked at it i was on the play on kinnon and then we had eureka in second seat we had tivet in third seat and we had marnius in fourth seat so three Demir slash Esper players versus Kinnon. So I'm like, cool, there will be Graft Digger's Cages. There will be Cursed Totems. I will not be able to do anything in this game. I was able to get off to a pretty good Kinnon activation focus start somehow, which I think was surprising to me, if I'm remembering that correctly. I definitely had a card advantage engine. This was one of those tournaments where I just, I got fortunate. I was able to find the card advantage engines a good percentage of the time. And those were really pushing me ahead. But at the same time, when we got to this pod, I offered the draw at the beginning because I was I was at 10 points. There were two rounds left. I offered the ID. Me and the Eureka player were both down to ID. The other two players did not have two wins yet, so they were unable to ID. We ended up having to play this game. And so in my brain, looking at this pod where I said it's Eureka, Tivit, and Marnius, I didn't think there was a realistic chance this game wasn't going to draw anyway. So I entirely kept a hand focused on just playing control and not letting people win and not really caring about winning the game was my was my mindset for this one, which led me to finding a Ristic study and led me to just hanging out for a pretty significant amount of time until, per usual, we hit that over the edge position where then you you start to become the problem and it started like a couple turns in advance where i was really starting to get a lot of cards and a lot of mana on board and we were i was going for a turn that was multiple various win lines where they ended up needing to use multiple pack of negations to stop my first couple win attempts because i just had so many cards in hand and then finally i throw out a basalt monolith um and the Marnius player shows the mind break trap on this basalt monolith. And in my brain, I'm like, this doesn't really matter. I think I still win this game because we pass the turn. Yuriko has no cards in hand or like one card in hand. They have like one ninja on board. I don't think they're close to winning the game. The other two players both have to pay for pack navigations. Like it's getting back to my turn anyway, but I was out of specific counter magic. And so in the effort to just not somehow randomly lose to something surprising out of Eureka or Tivit, I said to him, I said, I will, I will not win the game right now. I will not activate Kinnon right here. I will, I will just like play out value and pass if you let this basalt go. And he probably should not have let me add that. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, he probably should not have let me have that one. Uh, but he did. He did let me have that one. And then I was able to go cool, infinite colorless, uh, one ring, wandering archaic, seed bore muse. And once I had the wandering archaic, it meant that the mind break trap no longer worked anyway. Yeah, so that they 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 pretty much just scooped it up on the following guy's upkeep. Round five, we just took an ID. Uh, we were all ready to just move on to top sixteen. Going into top sixteen, so it, it, the Swiss record ended up being Temujin was the first overall seed going four and one. I was the second overall seed going three one and one. And then the guy Deshaun, the other Kinnam player from our round one pod, was the three seed also going three one and one. So my my opponent win percentage was the most disgusting in this tournament that it has ever been in my life. <laughs> like just having having three top seeds happen to have been in the same round one pot against each other is wild. Um so going into my top 16 game, I was on the play. We had a guy I've I've played a few games with around here, uh Tommy, I believe his name is, on Blue Farm in second seat. We had Magda in third seat, and we had Tivit in fourth seat. Okay. Okay. So. <laughs> this was one of the longest games I've ever played in a tournament. It went three and a half hours. <laughs> this was this was brutal. And the reason it was so brutal was because Tivit's plan, which I don't think is an unreasonable plan, it was totally, totally a fair call, was to turn to a curse totem and trust in that curse totem. And that curse totem, really, really good against myself and Magda really shut down our ability to play this game effectively. What it did not do anything to was Blue Farm, mm. who was then allowed to just do their stuff, which naturally progressed the game into Blue Farm becoming the enemy, but them having significantly more card advantage anyway, and there's not really that much we can do about that. You know, Magda is kind of just sitting there making treasures, doing the dwarf thing, kind of. Uh, but like, you know, I'm not able to actually do much with my hand. I end up with just like random pieces of interaction and like I drew into all of my, all of my cool lands. Like I just had Manamo and Treasure Vault and Emergent Zone just like all from the start pretty much. In the early part of the game, even though there was, so there was this Curse Totem on turn two, right? On turn three, I'm looking at a hand that does nothing but... Do something that would win the game if there wasn't a curse totem, but doesn't work now. I essentially am able to just moon silver key for basalt monolith, play basalt, trophy mage for mirage mirror, and then all I could do, I would be hellbent at that point, and my cannon can't activate. And I literally told them, I was like, because because what ended up happening is my basalt is on the stack and the tivet goes to mind break trap it, and I'm like, hear me out. I would like to explain to you exactly everything I'll be doing with this and reveal to you my entire hand. I will be playing as Trophy Mage. I will be playing as Mirage Mirror. I know that that is terrifying. <laughs> All I want to do is turn my Mirage Mirror into a Timna, swing with Kinnon, and draw one card. <laughs> and then I'll pass the turn. And that's literally all I could do. I was hellbent. I was hellbent. That was the only thing I could do, was turn it into a Timna so that I could draw one fucking card. And... Unfortunately, this was the same Tivit player from the previous game where the Mind Break Trap didn't stop me when they should have cast it. So he was like, I'm going to Mind Break Trap that Basalt. And I was like, okay, that's fair. So my Basalt in exile for pretty much this entire game is an important facet of it. I end up getting to a position many turns later that I have a Grim Monolith. And then I'm able to magically draw into Nyx Plumage it. And I'm like, we're... We're right back where we started, baby. <laughs> so I, I'm able to play out the Nyx Bloom Ancient and do the same infinite thing. But again, I have nothing to do in my hand. There's a Curse Totem. I literally turned my Mirage Mirror into... I think I used the infinite to turn it into a Timit this time. Or I might have Timna. But either way, I, I turned it into a Timit and just like drew cards with clues and treasures. I couldn't actually do anything. Same situation as when I was trying to do it on turn three, several turns later. Um, this got to a spot where, like I said, Blue Farm was clearly the threat and we weren't able to really effectively do things about it. And at the same time, to deal with Blue Farm one of the times he tried to do a win attempt, Tivit cast Intuition. I gave him the counter spell, and Tivit put Savin's Reclamation and Time Sieve in his graveyard. So now we also have to constantly politic to be able to stop Blue Farm while not losing to Tivit oh at God. the same time, which also leads to us keeping Blue Farm alive more than we maybe should have at times because he was able to deal with the Tivit wins. 
So we were in this very bad prisoner's dilemma situation for a lot of this game. And what we were doing to kind of limit Blue Farm's capabilities was Tibbet kept swinging Tibbet at Blue Farm, and I kept turning my Mirage Mirror into a Tibbet and swinging it at Blue Farm. So he got really low on life really, really quickly. And then when he's down to like four life finally at this point, just doesn't really have anything going on, he Vampiric Tutors, and I have a very good suspicion that he got Thassa's Oracle or, or Demonic Consultation at this point because his graveyard wasn't the best. And so I figure that's probably what he's going for here. And so he ends up casting a Dockside. And then me and Magda have been talking for a little bit where he has a py Pyrite Spellbomb that can do two damage. And I can turn my Mirage Mirror if we need to into a Pyrite Spellbomb to do two damage. So we could <laughs> kill Blue Farm. But but he doesn't want to use the Pyrite spell bomb yet. And so he starts doing things. I'm like, well, up. before you do something, like, can we talk about this interaction to make sure we're using it right? And he goes, I'm trying to kill him right now. And I go, that sounds great. <laughs> you do you. And he casts the spell. I forget what it was called. It's from Lord of the Rings. It's the one that does, you can improvise it. It's five mana. It does five damage to any target. And excess damage makes that many treasures. So it's an interesting magnet card. But so he's at four life. So this is lethal. So he then has to use his demonic consultation to find a counter spell instead of using it to win the game. Nice. So he has to he has to waste his Demcon. Um, and then the Dockside is able to resolve. This Dockside made 21 treasures. <laughs> And he just, like, played out value pieces to try and survive a turn cycle. I think we weren't able to kill him that same turn cycle because he played out more blockers, but we were able to kill him the turn cycle afterwards because he needed to try and find a way, so he had to swing with Krom and stuff to get Timna draws, and then we were able to kill him the following turn cycle. But he was able to also... We were able to stop Tivit for that turn cycle, so that was okay. Finally, maybe two and a half hours into this game... Blue Farm dies. Now it's me and then Magda and then Tibbet as the turn order. And at this point in the game, to give the context for the situation, just from various things that had occurred, Magda has Magda and like 13 treasures on board. So if the curse totem's ever gone, it's over. they have an instant yeah. speed win. Tibbet has a curse totem and a graph digger's cage. They have Tibbet on board. They have enough artifacts that it's not a concern for naming the amount of artifacts. They have Savin's Reclamation and Time Steve in their graveyard. And from earlier conversations trying to stop something else, where we had revealed information one, to one another, I know he has a couple extra cards at this point, but I know he has Transmute Artifact and Tainted Pact in his hand. On my board, I have Kinnon, I have Mirage Mirror, I have Grim Monolith, I have Treasure Vault, I have Manamo, um, I have a Glenelendra, which is turned off by the Curse Totem, but I had been politicking with this Glenelendra because I played it really confidently on purpose to see if they would miss that. And they all fully believe this Glenelendra could fuck their shit up, which is part of what was preventing Tivit from going off on some earlier turns. And so, finally, and, and my Nyx Bloom is in my graveyard and my Basalt is in exile are all relevant pieces of context. A lot of context. My hand at this point is also exactly Endurance Green Card, Force of Negation, two lands, and a completely useless crop rotation. That just, like, I have no targets for the crop rot that matter. Uh, my Emergent Zone is in the graveyard. Manamo Treasure Vault already on board. Magda goes, I need to kill this Glenelendra. Kills the Glenelendra with the Pyrite Spell Bomb. The most obvious tell for he has removal for the Curse Totem, and he needs me to not be able to protect him with Glenelendra. Once Glenelendra is dead, I'm like, I hope you guys realize couldn't have done anything anyway and they're like oh <laughs> that's funny <laughs> but uh but it, it you know that sold me on i am certain he has removal for the curse totem right so we're on tibbet's turn now and tibbet goes to flashback their savin's reclamation i respond by evoking my endurance putting the time even into a library i know they have the transmute artifact and the tainted pact but so i say to them i say you know he goes to tap his lands obviously for the transmute artifact and i go don't do it man I have a counter for it. Magda obviously has removal for the Curse Totem. If you make me use it, they're going to win on top and it won't matter. Which is also me checking to see if he has a counter for my counter. Right. I want to know. So, because you can use all the information in weird politics 100%. and deals and you can, just, you can figure shit out with it. Yeah, it's all very important. The more you talk, the more you know. He slams, yep. he slams the transmute artifact, right? Which means he's, he's got, got the counter spell. 
He's got the counter spell or something that can get it. It was, he didn't have a counter. He had the Tate Impact that could get a counter was the thought. Right. Same idea though. So, you know, I immediately am like, fuck. And Magda goes, well, you're going to counter it, right? And I go, I don't think I should. And he goes, why would you not, why would you not counter it? And I go, well, I know you have removal for the curse totem. And he goes, I haven't shown it to you. I go, yeah, but I know you have removal for the curse totem. Like that's, that's obvious. It's basic deduction, my guy. And so why would I counter this and then just lose to you? There's no increase in EV for me. There's no difference. I don't want to king make and just decide who wins. That's not really what I want to do. And he goes, but he's trying to win first. Wouldn't you just stop the person who's trying to win first? And I'm like, well, no, again, same thing. Like that's just king making. Either way you lose. And I, either way I lose there. So why would I care? And so he's like, so what can we do here? And I'm like, well, we could make a deal and that's about it. And he goes, okay, so what would be the deal? And I go, well, first I need to see your hand. And he goes, can I see yours as well? And I said, absolutely. And and I, I give him my hand, which is Force of Negation, two lands, Crop Rot. Obviously nothing that wins in it and doesn't do anything. Basalt's in exile, Nyx Bloom's in the yard. Like, I can't do shit from that position. And his hand is a braid and a land. And so I go, cool. Have removal for Curse Totem, as I thought. And I think for a second, and I go, I want two turns. I want two turns. You know? One top deck isn't enough where I care. I don't think I'm gonna I don't I don't care about just having one draw step to maybe to maybe get lucky here. I want I want two turns. Uh you cannot abrade that curse totem or remove the curse totem anyway, and you cannot use that abrade on my shit either. And I will force of negation this. And a very important thing I said afterwards is I said, and if he goes to counter my force of negation, you are welcome to win on top. I will not stop you from winning on top of him if he's winning the game. Which is very important because he agrees to this deal. And so then I play Force of Negation on the Tivit player's Transmute Artifact, and he immediately starts going to counter, and I go, if you do not have a counter for his Abrade as well, you lose here. Right. And so I say, so you have to let this go. And he <laughs> obviously is a little frustrated by this, and then has to let it go, and lets my Force of Negation resolve countering the Transmute Artifact. So I went from a position of two players have deterministic wins, essentially on the sack or ready to go. Buying two turns. And I have absolutely and I have absolutely nothing to I have bought myself two turns. Um I untap for turn, top deck, Tezzer at the Seeker, baby. I already got Manamo on board. Awesome. And I, you know, Basalt's an exile, Grimmel is there, whatever. So I I slam Tezzeret, get the one ring, tap it, untap with Manamo, tap again, draw those three cards all interaction it was like chain of vapor Ottawara, something else which was like okay this might keep me alive anyway good shit good shit and then because of the deal magda pretty much just like drew past tivit draw they lost their access to to transmute they had the tainted pact but you know at this point i've drawn more cards and right, i don't know if they're resolved. ready to go yeah. that and and and, and, I, and i and i told magda that they're allowed to win on top of tivit's win so tivit can't go for the win unless he also has the answer for magda's a braid right so I've put them in this little prisoner's dilemma. And so he essentially just draw passes over to me. And also very importantly, again, because all of these Tivit attacks earlier in the game, I'm at a very distant life total because I had this Manamo early. So even though I was swinging at people with Tivit, I was leaving up enough mana that I could turn my Mirage Mirror into a Tivit again and untap it with Manamo to block. <laughs> because of all of these attacks earlier in the game and my ability to hold up my Tivit as a blocker, Everyone else was at really low life totals and mine's still at like 25. So everyone is in a position that if they swing, they're dead to crackbacks. Mm. So everyone has to hold up their blockers. So no one was even attacking. No one was really doing anything. It was really just like draw pass for those players. So I go to what will be my second turn of the deal, the last turn of the deal, where the wording with Magda was on your following upkeep, like after my turn is completely over, not my end step, like after my turn, you're free to win the game if you can, like whatever was the way we did it um but so i untap before i draw i tap the one ring last card i draw is colossal sky turtle which uh conveniently can get me back my nyx bloom ancient i'm like okay draw for turn channel my colossal sky turtle get back my nyx bloom ancient this is where they should have fought probably but they did not get the nyx bloom ancient to land have infinite colorless with my grim monolith crack a treasure that i had from being a timid before for four blue Tap my Manama to untap my One Ring, draw another four cards, draws me conveniently into a Force of Will and a Cyclonic Rift, and I go, fuck it. Overloaded Cyclonic Rift on the stack, baby. <laughs> and this is where um, they had to fight. And at this point, I already have Infinite Colorless. I have Treasure Vault on the battlefield untapped. I have a Mirage Mirror. Like, even if Magda did choose to break her deal, like, yeah, at that point. hit Kennen or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, so I don't care. 
um, which he was a man of his word. He didn't use it. And Tibbet had to obtain a pact for an answer. They obtain a pact and hit. They run a counter. I show the force of will, and they go, fuck. Okay, you got us. And, uh, you know, at that point, I just win. They just scooped, but, like, you know, I have I have infinite colored and I can do whatever. I win the game. Damn. Wild. Uh, that was one of the best politics of my life, I think. That deal. That was that was a really good one. I went from being dead to both players to buying time and somehow winning the game. Um, Desert off the that top. That one I'm pretty, pretty proud nice. of. Tezzeret off the top. Tezzeret was very lucky. Because, again, like, I showed my hand. My hand had nothing. <laughs> my hand yeah. had nothing in it at all. That was a very lucky top deck. But also, at that point in the game, like, I have a lot of good top decks. Um, obviously, the Wondering itself would have just been fantastic. Yeah, just but I also good. have all the artifact. Yeah. But, like, every artifact tutor works the same there where I get the Wondering. Yeah. So I have, like, eight draws that result yep. in that same thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lots of good outs. Uh, so that worked out. That worked out really, really well. And then we go to the finals. And... Before the finals even starts, again, this game went three and a half hours. So we are already at like 11 at night at this point. And all the other three people who have finished their top 16 games long before, they come up to me and they go, hey, man, uh, we don't really want to play. We just want to split the money and go home, which is, you know, you'll 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 technically take first in the standings because I was the highest who made it to the, to the final four. Um, so like you'd get the top deck points and shit. But we we kind of just want to split and go home. Which is the same as, you know, the fishbowl situation that we talked about right. last week. Um, and I believe my exact word-for-word -word response was, get fucked, we're playing. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, I, I quote-unquote said, get fucked, we're playing, I want to win a tournament. Yeah. I and uh, so we did. And the, the final four was myself, Deshaun, the same kid and player from around one pod, uh, a Sese player in third seat, and then guess what deck was in fourth seat? Uh, Kinnon. Another Kinnon deck. Yeah, so our finals was Kinnon, 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 <laughs> Sisse. Fuck that. Jesus Christ. Wild. So uh, this game was also absolutely wild. Where I kept a hand that was just mana. I just kept mana instead of trust. And I was like, that's just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just mana, please. Like, this game's not going fast. Whatever. Um, ended up Deshaun sitting next to me. He kept, like, when he would hold his hand, he would put it down. But when he would put it down, he would put it where, like, it was in a stack together. But one card was just facing me. Uh. <laughs> so I kept seeing singular cards from his hand. So, like, I knew he had Trophy Mage. I knew he had Fierce Guardianship for, like, right away, like, the first turn of this game from just, like, him showing his hand accidentally. Yeah, I mean, I was able to just kind of, like, play Mana Pass, do the normal thing. No one really did anything disgusting. I had, like, seven mana on board turn two for a turn three activation type of setup. My first Kinnon activation hit me Thorn Mammoth, which I was like, that's honestly the perfect board control piece for, for what I need right now in this matchup. That's, like beyond beautiful so i'm able to kind of like ping down some random people's you know dorks and kinnons and stuff with it i ended up hitting deshaun's bloom tender next to me and not his kinnon on sisse's turn he throws an agatha's soul cauldron on the stack and there's bloom tenders and stuff in the graveyard so that's a notable spell so the kinnon player in fourth seat taps his armored scrap gorger to exile the bloom tender before that can even be on the battlefield and then just with the mana goes i'm just going to activate the kinnon now Activates his cannon, hits Tide Spout Tyrant. Tyrant. Yep. And I'm like, that's a fucking problem. So I I don't want him to get to untap or do anything else first with the Tide Spout because I have the Thorn Mammoth now. So I activate my cannon and I hit Phyrexian Metamorph. I have it come in as a copy of Tide Spout Tyrant, also with the rocks to win on my battlefield. Thorn Mammoth trigger, target his Tide Spout Tyrant. He then has to use a Pact of Negation on the Agatha Soul Cauldron that's still in the stack just so he can bounce my Thorn Mammoth so his Tide Spout doesn't die. And so then before his turn, I have to mini rift his Tide Spout Tyrant. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So the end result of that was his Tide Spout's in his hand. I have a Metamorph copy on the battlefield. He has to pay for his Pact so he's not able to do anything. Before my turn, Sisse dismembers my Tide Spout. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, okay. So I don't have a Tide Spout. We had to use some interaction on these things, right? So then we go to my next turn where I just kind of like untap, pass, you know, hold up my Kinnon activation type thing. And at this point, Deshaun's board is three lands of Mirage Mirror and Kinnon. And he just goes, cool, Basalt Monolith. 
So I've been aware that this guy has a fierce in hand. Has a has a fierce and had trophy mage in hand. I wasn't expecting just natty basalt and mirror. Yeah. I remember when he played the mirror, I'm like, okay, remember he has trophy mage in hand. That's his way to get basalt, but I'm not worried about that when he only has three mana. Right. He's not there yet. Right. But I wasn't ready for just natty play basalt. And so I'm like, fuck. And I'm like, I know he has a fierce. I say that to the table. And so I'm like, okay, I guess make you use it. I use my last piece of interaction, which was a chain of vapor on his Kinnon, which he then has to fierce. And then Sissa is able to go, cool, deflecting SWAT. SWAT's the fierce to the basalt. Nice, nice. So basalt gets countered, chain of vapor bounces Kinnon. Uh, Deshaun was frustrated in this moment, which I think this is a really good learning and explanation moment as well. Um, he was a little mad at the politics of this because what happened was Sissé cast a deflecting SWAT and he was just like, yeah, deflecting SWAT, the fierce to the SWAT. And, and we were immediately like, no, 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 no. SWAT it, the fierce to the, to the, the to the, uh, yeah. the salt. Yeah. And, and Deshaun was immediately like talking to the judge, like, yo, they've already declared their targets and shit and got really frustrated about it. And, and what we were trying to explain to him, we were like, it doesn't matter. Deflecting SWAT, it doesn't matter what you say you're going to do before the spell resolves. Yeah, because you just declare you, the target of the spell. You... And then you, you decide what target, you're deflecting to what. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You only target a spell or ability. Right. Like what you change it to, you do not decide until the resolution of the spell. So like none of that actually matters. Right. So it was all totally fine. Fair play, whatever. Right. Uh, but he was clearly a little frustrated by that. And uh, yeah, I mean, got got wrecked by that whole series of interactions. We go to Sisei's turn. They play an Oko and an Ashiok. <laughs> And so they Oko my Thorn Mammoth, so they finally deal with that problem, because I just, like, replayed the Thorn Mammoth, I think. I'm, oh, no, I didn't hold up Kinnon Activation. I replayed the Thorn Mammoth, and I dealt with um yeah. with the other Kinnon's Kinnon or something like that. Kinnon's, yeah, this, Kinnon's this game was killing ridiculous. Kinnon's. Amazing. Kinnon's killing Kinnon's. Kinnon's, Kinnon's killing Kinnon's. And so then he Oko's my Thorn Mammoth, and the turn before I had actually hard cast a Void Winner. So there's a Void Winner on the board, which is kind of shutting down my opponents as well. Right. This game, there's a lot of things going on. This was late night. I'm sorry for the cluttered. I know my explanations are not the best today. <laughs> I apologize. But so I go to my my turn. I have a Void Winnower. I have an Oko Thorn Mammoth. I have, I think, 10 mana. And I I only have three cards in hand. And none of them are interaction at this point. So I'm like, cool. I'll do a main phase Kinnon activation. So I main phase, activate my Kinnon, and I hit my own Tide Spout Tyrant. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> I can win the game. So I cast my Mox Diamond, Tides by Tyrant Trigger, target my Mana Vault. In response, the other Kinnon player activates Kinnon, the fourth seat one. He hits his Void Winnower. Oh my so God. then I I have to blow my Fierce Guardianship. Well, my interaction didn't cost mana. I had a free piece of interaction. which is why I could spin on my phase. I have to blow my Fierce Guardianship on my own Mox Diamond to Tide Spout Tyrant Trigger, bounce his Void Winnower. <laughs> And then, and then in response to that, Deshaun turns his Mirage Mirror into a copy of Void Winner. Oh <laughs> like, my <fuck>. god. <laughs> so I'm just sitting there like, okay. And then I immediately have to do math. Because then the only spell in my hand that I can restart a loop with after also bouncing the additional Void Winner would be a Trinisphere. Which really fucks up the math on Tide Spot Tyrant Loops. So I sit there for like a minute trying to do this math and figure out if there is a line that's possible. And this judge was ready to go home. He immediately just gave me a slow play warning. And I was like, okay, bro, <laughs> like, sure. I can't win. So I'm just like, okay, I guess I'll just pass and and like do it in the Mana Vault way where I'm able to hold up one more Kinnon activation, I think, or something. Or maybe I, I couldn't get there quite, but I just played the Mana Vault, whatever. Uh, and then, you know, Deshaun can't really do much. Sisse, um, I did attack them in a way that killed their Oko and Ashiok, so they weren't able to win the game. And then the following Kinnon player, before his turn, activates Kinnon again, or on his turn, activates Kinnon, and he hits Flush Duplicate. Oh, I'm sorry. There was actually one more turn cycle here. It wasn't like this. <laughs> yes. We ended up... Sorry, it's such a long day. There was one more turn cycle where, like, my Tide Spout is an Elk at this point. Um, I wasn't able to kill the Oko that turn. I killed it the following turn after it elks my Tide Spout Tyrant. And then the other Kinnon player, so before his following turn, he has the Kinnon activation held up going one extra turn cycle around. And he hits Flush Duplicate. Now, I have been in tournament games where this interaction has come up and needed judge rulings before. I'll give you a second as the audience to think about this. 
if I have a Tide Spout Tyrant, That's a elk. and that Tide Spout Tyrant has been elked by Oko, and my opponent, for whatever way, tutoring for it, can activation, playing it from hand, whatever, gets a clone, and they clone that elk Tide Spout Tyrant. What is it? Man. Is it a Tide Spout Tyrant that's regular, or is it a 3 3 elk with no abilities, just named Tide Spout Tyrant? I have had this come up in my games and tournaments before, and it has always fucked me where I thought it came in as the actual thing, not the elk thing, and the judge ruled notebook copies what it is at the time, so it's just a 3 3 with no abilities. So I've been fucked by this ruling. This judge lets him know it enters as an actual Tide Spout Tyrant. And I'm immediately flabbergasted because I have been fucked by this going the other way. So I fight this and I immediately try and appeal. I'm like, I would like to appeal this. And he goes, no, I am the head judge. That is my ruling. We're going home soon. And I'm like, I'm, I'm frustrated by this. Um, and this results in that Kinnon player winning the game. Where he's able to just go off a tight spot and we don't have any interaction to stop him. Um, so I lost. I lost the finals game. I I did speak with the judge after the game, and what he did was he went through all of the official rulings and everything for me to prove to me that this was the correct ruling. And I do at this point believe he is correct. The frustrating part is now I've just been fucked by this being ruled in both ways, and it's never been ruled in the favorable way for me. So that's annoying um, and really frustrating. But now I know for the future that if you elk my shit, I can clone it, and it's the real deal, which is nice. Um, but that was the tournament. It was a really fun event overall. I had a really, really good time. Always fun to jam Kinnon. Always nice to get another another top four in Kinnon. Um, yeah, very nice, man. Very nice. Yeah. Are we gonna are we gonna play Kinnon some more later this month or next I don't month know. or what are you doing? Oh, at Punt City? Yeah. I don't know. I'm honest. I'm honestly considering Italian for Punt City. Um, I might. It's it's probably Kinnon or Italian though. Would that makes my, sense. Would be my assumption. Makes right sense. Now. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of interesting anecdotes there, uh, especially you know, regarding Kinnon in general, just because he ran into it so often, um, and specifically, you know, some good insights as to how to beat it. So you know, we talked about this a little bit last week about doing this, and you know. We talked to each other about like, well, how do you beat Kinnon? And I think we're pretty much on the same page, aren't we? Um, you know, what is it that makes Kinnon so good in the first place? And I'll, you're going to answer that question, not me. You know, what is it that makes Kinnon so good? Uh, what makes Kinnon so good is the fact that he is a, a crazy ritual. He yeah. is a mana doubler. That is first and foremost his most primary ability, which leads to people often doing what I think is the wrong thing, which is where they focus on killing the Kinnon. And there's definitely value in killing the Kinnon. I'm not saying never touch the Kinnon, but it's actually way more impactful to defeat Kinnon decks by attacking their mana resources right. rather than the Kinnon itself. It's just a right. more effective overall strategy. Sure, like both ways have pros and cons. You know, if I have a bunch of dorks on board and you decide to shoot down the dorks before Kinnon, most of the time I think that is correct. Will that technically open up to I could natty, I could naturally have basalt, and it didn't matter that you killed my dorks? Absolutely. In in the world where it's basalt monolith specifically, it matters more that you kill Kinnon. But at a higher EV percentage of the time, limiting our mana resources limits our ability to function and play the game because most of our deck is such a high CMC. Yeah, and like I I'm playing a lot of four, five, six, seven drops. Yeah, I've seen a lot of patterns playing against Kinnon where people will. Um, repeatedly just kill the kitten and leave all the dorks untouched. And, and the problem with that is, okay, the dorks are ramp, right? So you kill the kitten once as a two mana commander, he's got the ability to recast it. And the more dorks get and, and rocks that come on the battlefield, the, the easier it is to recast it. So all you're really doing is throwing your resources away uh, on something that's just going to come back. Now it's different if you're if you're using like an Orcish Bowmaster or something and you're using the pings from the Orcish Bowmaster to keep kitten down. Right, that makes a lot of sense. But really, you know, if I'm playing a deck like Florian, for example, where I have a high amount of kill spells and the ability to control the board a little bit with like a Mayhem Devil or something like that, I'm killing the dorks all day long. I want those those mana resources off the battlefield if I can. Um, I think it's shown really well by games like my top 16 game of the Boil, where that was a game where there was a Dranith. I never had access to Kinnon. And I have a lot of games where there's a Dranith and I never have access to Kinnon. And people just allow me to develop. And the result of that is normally I win those games yeah. because yeah. if you just leave all my dorks and all my rocks and I have all my mana resources, 
I can just hard cast bangers. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Exactly. Like I still have access to everything. Yeah, at its core, I feel like Kinnon is a ramp deck. You know, it, it runs big fatties that have massive impact on the board, and it ramps really hard. So even if you keep Kinnon off the board, if that mana gets up there, you have the ability to drop those big fatties on the board. And to be clear, one of the sentences in the early parts of the primer says it is the premier ramp deck of the format. Uh, well, see? I didn't even read that part of the primer <laughs> and I knew. Right? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. So, you know, attacking the mana base is so important uh, to, to keeping yeah. Kinnon down. The other part is Kinnon is vulnerable to some silver bullets on some level. Um, you know, the big one being, you know, Curse Totem. Um, mm-hmm. and, and because Curse Totem hits it on two axes, you know, number one, it, it stops the Kinnon activations, which, as we said before, is not the, the biggest part of the deck, but it is the way that Kinnon finishes a lot of the time. And the other thing it does is it turns off those mana dorks, which attacks the mana supply at the same time. So that's why Curse Totem is a really strong card against Kin. Um, yeah, I mean, if you go if you go into my primer, there is one uh, chapter called Chapter Nine: What Are This Deck's Weaknesses, where I focus on essentially three primary categories: artifact hate, activated ability hate, and put things into play hate. Yep. So the artifact hate is where you get your Karns, your collector roofs, your null rods, your stony silences. The activated abilities is where you get the curse totems, the drawn on limbalas, and such. To put things into play is your Grafdigger's Cage, your Weathered Rune Stone, your Containment Priest type effects. Those are the best three effects against Kinnon. Right. I don't like like Oppo, Dranith, all of those things will sometimes affect Kinnon, but not as consistently on the same level. What's really important to recognize though is that Kinnon is not effectively shut down by just having one of those three categories on the board. Right. Having just one of those three categories generally doesn't matter. Artifact is the strongest of those three categories to have individually because that really limits a lot of our abilities in terms of just mana production. If we have an all dork hand, then great, but that's we have a lot more rocks than we have dorks, so on average artifact hate is the strongest. The activated ability hate, cool. I can't activate my cannon and sure I can't tap my dorks for mana but all of my rocks still produce right. more mana I can still hard cast everything and then to put things into play hate again it's just taking away cannon's activated ability very similar to curse totem and it's taking away the creature tutors which is nice as well but you're not taking away my ability to just produce a lot of mana the artifact one is what really generally hits my ability to produce a lot of mana and that's why that's the best one against me but only having one of these things tends to be weak and easy to play around because I have so many options that get around individual versions of them. The best, most often being Hallbreaker Horror and Tides by Tyrant. Right. If I am able to get access to one of those cards, it pretty much beats any stacks pieces you have. Because if I'm able to go infinite, obviously the artifact hate can be really rough there because then I'm not able to use my rocks to go infinite there. But if you just have a curse totem and a graph digger's cage in play, cool. I would like to play this Hallbreaker War. I would like to produce infinite mana. I would like to cast a spell and graph, bounce the graph digger's cage. I would like to cast a spell and bounce the curse totem. I would like to win at instant speed on top of everything you're doing. So there are a lot of lines in Kinnon that get around those things. And that's why it can be really important going back to the beginning of the conversation. If you get rid of our mana rocks, if you get rid of our mana production, we have no lines. Right. That's really the way to properly shut down Kinnon. But it is also, I, I do want to preface this, like we're saying to do all of these things and a lot of people don't have consistent, easy ways to just get rid of mana rocks, right? Like that's not a common thing in the format. But I'm not afraid you don't to, but I'm not, I'm not afraid to, for example, counter a Chrome, a Chrome Mox on turn one. I'm not afraid to do that in some instances, depending on the pod situation. Uh, I would almost of course not of course not of course not but it depends on the situation I mean you're not just do it in in a vacuum but if if you're looking at a situation where like Kinnon has mold really low um, and you know they're clearly that the only the only mana rock they're going to get is a chrome mox or they're only going to get you know they have like four cards left at hand or whatever they they go chrome mox exiling something you know they're they're probably in 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 a trouble spot. And I think it's reasonable. Right, but then you don't have to worry about them anyway. Mm, I don't agree with like, that. Realistically, no, you, you, I mean, we're playing against powerful seasons. You arrange an accident for Kinnon if you can. Like, you just do it. It's, I mean, it is very important. Like, that, that's one of the things that it, it's a balance because you can't overreact to certain decks oh, because it, then you just depends. let other it, decks it, it all depends on what you have. Like, it, it, it's very dependent. But I think it's reasonable when you're playing against a Kinnon deck if you could shut down one axie, you know, one axis. Like, if you... You play a curse totem, for example, right? You play the curse totem. It is then reasonable to evaluate their plays based on the other angles that they can come at you from. Like, okay, mm-hmm. if they're going to play rocks, it's not crazy to counter a rock in some situations. Um, 
You know, I'm not saying do it normally. I, dude, you're getting, yeah, I was going to say, I don't You I don't get defensive about it, but like, you know, that's because you're the kid. No, play. because I, because <laughs> like this, this sounds like terrible play and I don't know why anyone would ever waste a counter spell on a, like a arcade signet. Uh, it depends on the situation. I mean, if you're, you know. Right. But I'm saying on average, that's never going to happen. Like, like how many times have you ever seen that occur? I'm not saying, like, I'm not going to tell someone that that's, you know, if I'm, if I'm giving them information on how to be kin in this podcast, I'm going to be honest. That's terrible magic play. There's no world that you just, like, blow a counterspell on an arcane signet in a random pod. No, I'm not saying random pod. I'm saying situational. Like, imagine, for example, you're, like, I'm playing Talion, and I've got a lock on the board. People are dying, uh, and the only player who really has steam at this point is the Kinnon player. I'm not afraid to burn a counterspell on a rock to keep them out of the game. I'm not. You may disagree with me. That's fine. We don't have to agree. Yeah, I disagree with you. I, I think okay. that this is bad information and bad magic play, and we should not be promoting that type of terrible resource management. Right, well, we might edit what? all this shit, but whatever. <laughs> you just trying to psy out people, bro? <laughs> no, but I'm just, I'm thinking through, like, I'm trying to think through, honestly, okay, how do I play against Kinnon? Like, if Kinnon is mm -hmm. playing a bunch limit of... Limit mana. Oh, sure. That's how you, in some, like, how do you limit mana? If they're playing rocks, how do you limit the rocks? <laughs> right. The rocks are the harder thing to deal with. That's where you require, so if you're on Italian, you tutor for Karn. Sure. What do you mean? Sure, sure. But, like, that's, that's your answer to the rocks. You don't waste counter right. spells in a rock. Right. But if you have, like, if you have Karn, right? Let's say you have Karn. You've cut off the mm -hmm. axis of, of rocks. Then they're leaning on mm -hmm. dorks. At that point, I want to kill the dorks. Yeah. Yes. But my point is, my point is, everything we just said would never result in you wasting a fucking counter spell in my arcane signet. I don't know. <laughs> nah, I'm serious. Like it depends what's going on. It it really does. Like if if sure if 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 there are other threats on the board, right? If there are other threats going on, then yeah, absolutely do that. Yeah, you know, you're you're mm -hmm. not going to use a counter spell on a, on a rock. You're just not going to do that. But it, but also, really important factor here when we're talking about this, just honestly, maybe just leave all this in because it's interesting for people to listen to this this little argument. I'm, I'm talking from the position of the average CDH situation. The average CDH situation is not, I've su su successfully shut down both other opponents and I don't have to consider them at all and I only have to worry about Kinnon. That is not the average CDH position that our listeners are going to be facing. Yeah, you know right. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the average CDH situation. And the average CDH situation is, it is good to get these effects on board. They have an effect on Kinnon. I have described their effect on Kinnon. The important factor is to not overfocus on the Kinnon and allow someone else to win, but be aware of the outs they have. Understand that when right. you have certain types of pieces, what type of lines they will be going for and be prepared for those lines. Right. But don't just like, don't just fucking like besage you their mana crypt for no fucking reason. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. That's, that doesn't even do much. That's what I mean. Get a, yeah, whatever. But that's my point is like the, the types of play that you were talking about with the counter spells there but, is like promoting that type of but, play of just deal with it just because it's there. But my point is, here's my point, And here's what I'm trying to get to is, OK, if you're in a board state where you look like you've got Kinnon on the rocks, right? You've got their mana dorks turned off with a curse totem and they're trying to find a line to win, right? Their line to win may be as simple as they need a rock. They need one rock on the battlefield that generates enough mana for them to do something like cast up assault and go for it. So, you know, mm -hmm. just being aware of. Like where their what yeah. what where their win line is going to come from, and at that point, their line is going to come from either removing simply removing the curse totem, right, mm -hmm. a hole breaker or a tight spot tyrant line, or they're going to get there via mana rocks. Like that's that's their lines mm -hmm. of attack. So you know, I don't know how they get there from mana rocks, but sure. <laughs> well, like they need like it's exactly basalt, right? Like if you well, have a curse totem, well, then their kin activations are shut well, off. Well, if they so want to like... play if they want to play a hole breaker horror, right? They need to have enough mana to cast right. it in the first place. Right, because they can't activate Kinnon, sure. so they got to hard cast it. So, like they're ramping, sure. they're ramping, right? So be aware again, how. Why, so do a count, like okay, how much mana do they have? They have, let's say they have three cards in hand, right? And they play, they've got uh, six mana on board, and they and they they play a rock that generate gets them up to, you know, enough to cast the Dice Tyrant. Like be aware of that what shit. Do you mean, bro? Yeah, be sure, be aware of what they can do. Do not overreact and blow your interaction on dumb shit. You should though. never overreact and blow your shit on dumb shit anyway. Like that's just a general You're describing blowing no, your shit saying, on dumb I'm shit. Not saying, like, I'm not saying like okay, I go turn one, play curse totem, turn you know, pass, Kinnon goes, I'm gonna cast an arcade signet. And you go, force of will, Spell pitching snare. a fierce guardian. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they're gonna be That's what it sounds like okay, you're saying. I, that's what it sounds fair. like. So let, just to clarify, like you know, you're in a game. It's progressed. You're, you're looking at the kid and player, yeah, yeah, yeah. and like, like, how can they win the game? What is their avenues to win the game? Yeah. And their avenue to win the game could be as simple as that last rock that gets them over the top, and a mana count that lets them cast something juicy, right? I'm not saying so like, and in, like, like you have to have, like, you have to pump them for information first, right? Like, what do they have? Sure. Like, if 
Okay, you know. I think you've overcomplicated this. I think the quick summary and the <laughs> easiest way to define it is it is better to hit Kinnon's dorks than it is to hit Kinnon a lot of the time. Yes. yes. Depending on how many mana rocks they have. You have to like also think about how much additional mana generation and how easily they can get back Kinnon. But generally, it's better to hit the dorks before it's to hit Kinnon. But when you're considering rocks versus Kinnon, it is normally better to hit Kinnon than it is to hit the rocks yes. because there's just not Agreed. a lot of removal for rocks. Agreed. That is the simplified form of everything we've been trying to say. Yeah, but... And and and, the, and then the last bit of it is <laughs> the last bit of it is the way I look at Kinnon when I'm when I'm playing against Kinnon is I'm always counting their mana. How much mana do they have available all the time? Mm-hmm. Always keeping track of that, and it it's sort of 15. like, <laughs> <laughs> but no, like think about what's possible. Like what can they do? Like they have, you sure. know, can they flash in a Hallbreaker horror? Can they, you know, hard cast a Void Winnower? Like where are they in 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 you know in capabilities at that point? And just always be keeping track of that. Always do that. <laughs> We just don't always have them in hand. Not if I kill your dorks, and not if I like play a card. No, yeah, you don't. but that's the thing is like you're not you're not wasting a deadly relic on a on a finhorn elf though. You know what I mean? Like most of the time, no, you're not. You're probably not. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. it'd be a corner case yeah, when exactly. you do. Right, that's my right. point. But but you will might you might think about like okay, my opponent has a Karn in play, and I really want my rocks to be free. But if that Karn dies to whatever you know, to the chain of vapor or whatever Kinnon's ca- uh, casting to get rid of it, I might want to defend that. Uh, Karn, uh, even if it's detrimental to me, because it might just Dude. like you know just straight up win over top. That's that's why I removed Karn. Honestly, was the amount of times that someone would go to Psych Rifted or Chain of Vapor it, and I would be like, "We lose here. You guys have to defend this." And they would look at their hand and they'd be like, "I can't win if it's there, so I'm gonna hope he can't win and just let it happen." Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, bruh. But, <laughs> like, like, but yeah, and that's and that's maybe that's but really my summary here is like you know how do you lose to Kinnon? Uh, you don't track where they are in their ramp cycle. Like where, are, you know, how much money do they have? How far along are they? What's what's uh, you know what's limiting them? And if you're not tracking that shit, you're gonna lose. It's just uh, I disagree with you. Really? Yeah, they always have a lot of mana. Like why? That's not. I mean, like keeping track of it to an extent, sure, but that's not really the focus of their capability. The focus of their capability often comes from a combination of mana paired with cards. Because they can have a shitload of mana. If they have no cards in hand, it's just Kinnon activations. I don't fucking care. Mm. I'm like, because then it's just then it's just kill the Kinnon. If they don't have cards in hand, then it's just kill the Kinnon. That's an easy way to sure, stop it, sure, right? Sure, 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 sure. So, yeah, yeah. but if they have a lot of if they have a lot of cards in hand, that's the concern. Well, but for me, if if there's a Kinnon on board and they have a shit ton of mana and they have enough for like a couple of activations, uh, I, kill the Kinnon. Uh, yeah, exactly. But I'm raising alarm. I'm raising yeah. the alarm bells. I'm like. No, we sure. have a problem. If Kinnon is on board and they have four mana, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, but it's kind of, I mean, essentially, like, you look at the, you look at CDH decks and they're going to function on normally a primary axis of cards or mana. That's that's a very simplistic way to describe it. But, like, Kinnon is the premier mana deck and Blue Farm, the other deck we're going to talk about, is the premier cards deck. So in a simplified form, cutting off Kinnon's access to mana or its access for utilization of that mana in the form of Cursed Totem Graph Digger's Cage type stuff, that's a very good way to effectively limit Kinnon. Yeah. There are always going to be outs to those scenarios, and they're important to be aware of, but your primary goals are going to be limiting mana production or limiting utilization of that mana. Yeah. That's the effective way to stop Kinnon. When you get to Blue Farm, Blue Farm is not a synergistic deck that needs a ton of mana all the time. They have explosive mana and dockside and rituals and whatever. That can often be in hand. Blue Farm's, Blue Farm's access, of adva- access of advantage is cards. So my opinion on how to stop Blue Farm is always limiting their fucking cards yep. because their cards don't yep. synergize. They don't synergize. Kinnon cards all work better together. The more Kinnon cards you have in the battlefield, the more powerful each individual card is because of how they function and how they interact. That's synergy. Blue Farm don't have that. Yeah, Blue great. Farm don't have that Agreed. shit. Yep. Blue Farm is just, I play really good cards and I draw a lot of them. So you want to beat Blue Farm, don't let them draw a lot of cards. The amount of times I have seen Timna just run free for turn after turn after turn is infuriating. Yeah. <laughs> why are people not killing Timnas? Why why do people not kill Timna? I don't I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And the thing about Blue Farm is Blue Farm has uh, really powerful payoffs. Like single card payoffs mm-hmm. is really what the deck is built around. You know, Adnaz, uh, you know, Breach. You know, those those are just single cards that win the game for Blue Farm. Like no other deck does, uh, but it needs to protect those things. So what what Blue Farm is constantly looking to do is draw lots of cards that number one control the game and keep them from losing, and number two set up that silence effect that they need 
to resolve that single card that uh, you know is a, is a game breaker. So if you can limit the number of cards that they can draw by shutting off Timna in particular, right? Kill the fucking Kimna. Don't let him have Timna. a Ristic. Don't let him have a fucking Yeah, limit their, limit guy. their, like, like I, I, my theory is if there's one blue farm with a Ristic, that's worse than two blue farms with two Ristics, right? But if you can, you know, I want to balance it. Again, we're going to disagree here. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't want blue farm to run off by itself. If there's two blue farms in my pod mm -hmm. and one of them gets a Ristic in play, I, I might go so far as to defend the other's Ristic because I want them to play against each other at that point. Um, okay, okay, okay. Well, cut that out. There's no world. I'm serious. <laughs> There's no world. I'm serious. I do, this. No I, do this with, world. I do this with Florian all the time. All the time. Because I'm not going to beat that one blue farm player when it comes to interaction. I'm not going to do it. But if I pin the two against each other, or let someone else go for it and, and have them both stop that player, that creates the window of opportunity for me to win. I never want, I never want one blue farm player to have all the card draw and the other blue farm player to be locked out. That is a bad space to be in, right? Um, because again, what that blue farm player is looking to do is set up either a silence effect or a mountain of interaction and then play that payoff card, right? And I'm not going to be able to fight that all the time. I'm not going to be able to fight it by myself. Even on even on Talion, it's difficult to fight the blue farm player who's trying to resolve a silence. It's just very difficult, mm -hmm. right? So if there's two blue farms at the ta table, I want I I want I want them on board to stop the other blue farm and vice versa. Like that's the way I play it. Sure, 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 sure. But don't let them have a Ristic study. The amount of times if you can I've stop the Ristic study, then stop else. the Ristic study. Sure. Yeah, yeah, but the amount, but the amount of times I've seen Waffle or someone maul low, and so they'll like you know turn one tutor for their Fisheristic, and then they'll play their Fisheristic on turn two with like two cards left in hand, and they're just like, look, I only have two cards in hand, just like let it go. We need we need things to stop this person. You know what I mean? And and they usually end up winning those games 100%. because they're allowed to have the Ristic resolve, and then people could have stopped it, and they don't. Yeah, yeah. Stop it. I'm red blasting just, a fucking. Don't let I'm him red have blasting it. a mystic or a mystic yeah. when I see it for sure. For sure. <laughs> don't let him have I, it. I will drop the mental misstep in a heartbeat on a, on a remora. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like uh, you know, agreed. Like the, the fundamentals are, you know, blue farm is not going to build up a board state uh, that eventually wins the game. That's not how blue farm works. Blue farm is going to build up a board state that draws them a bunch of cards that wins them. So if you can yeah. limit their draw engines, you know, kill Timna. Don't feed, you know, the Krom if you can avoid it. Don't play two spells that are irrelevant. Don't don't drop a, a talisman that you don't need as a second spell. Mm -hmm. Like just don't give them those cards. Dude, that's a huge one. I don't know why people they'll they'll just like play random mox opal that does nothing as second spell for turn. And I'm just like, why? Right. <laughs> like why? Right. Or, why or they play it. I've seen people do things like they have their commander in play and they play a jeweled lotus as their second spell. And I'm like, please, please. Why are you just giving them a free card? And this happens all the time. So, like, yeah. you know, like, part of, you know, my my theory about CDH in general is don't worry about just you. Like, pay attention to your opponents and tell them, like, dude, don't play a second spell unless you need to. Like, if you need to and it's, like, huge, uh, impactful, you know, sure. But why are you just giving this guy free cards? Just stop it. Don't do that. Yeah. You know, and for God's yeah. sakes, kill the fucking Timna. No, like, really? Timna needs to die. I pongify Timnas all the time. Yeah. I've seen you people know? do I'm shit like, like oh, they're gonna they're gonna lose three and draw three here. Cool, I'm gonna pongify the Timna. Like, yeah, I've seen people do shit like they'll cast an Orcish Bowmaster, <laughs> and they ping something else, and like, no, you ping the Timna. That's the only thing you 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 you, you ping here is the Timna. And then if they decide they want to draw the card anyway, then yeah, then you kill the fucking Timna. You don't start killing yeah. dorks at that point. You kill the Timna. The the amount of times I've had like four men on board and someone kills my dork when they could have killed the Timna, I'm like, bro. Yeah, yeah, it <laughs> happens way too often. Way too often. Yeah. You know, I, I I'm always killing a Timna if I can. I will also always clone a Timna if I can because, you know, I do clone Timna a lot. Yeah. If if you if you haven't played Blue Farm, clone a Timna and watch how much that thing draws. It's kind of insane. Mm -hmm. Kind of insane. It's way more than it's And the thing is, like, t it, it goes under the radar for a lot of people because they're always looking for, oh, the win conditions or, oh, you know, the creature that I need to stop to win the game. And and, and I get that. It's, it's important to not overreact to things that do not win. And that's why Blue Farm is allowed to get away with a lot because a lot of their individual pieces don't win. Right. They just draw cards. 
And so people are like, okay, we just got to let that happen and interact with the other things. But what you have to recognize is it's this mental calculation where you have to say, okay, what are the odds I need this removal spell for something in the next like two turns? You know, am I really going to lose the game if I blow this here right now? Also, if I don't use this within the next two turns on Timna, they're drawing six additional cards. Right, right. If I could, if I could tell you that your one mana removal spell, your swords to plowshares, said Blue Farm draws six less cards. If you just phrase it like that, yeah, in your brain suddenly you're like, oh, that seems really worth it for the swords yeah. to plowshares. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. that's what it is a lot of the time. It's two, four, six cards in a couple of turns, almost always off of just like a Timna, and 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 no one ever removes it. And, he, and here's another thing: don't disable your opponent's ability to block and deal with Timna. Like I've seen so many games where you know the, the blue farm player goes Timna, Crown, pass, and the next player in turn order goes Drenith. I'm like, what are you doing? Like it's too late. You're playing a Drenith now. All that does is disable your opponent's ability to get into the game to block the Timna, and you just let Blue Farm run away with it. Like you, hands the game to Blue Farm. Yeah, yeah. you, you got to be yeah, aware that was, of that I stuff. I mean, that was the same way. Like like Blue Farm mauled the lowest in my top sixteen game, but Tivit played a turn two curse totem. And then Blue Farm was allowed to just develop. Right. And we had to all work as a table to 3v1 them. Yeah. And uh, like, getting around your the obstacles you made for yourself. You know? Yeah. You know, and, and that's the thing about Blue Farm is Blue Farm is not susceptible to most of the stacks pieces that are in the format right now. You know, yes, Graph Digger's Cage, for example, will turn off. Drenith Magistrate will turn off Ex a breach exactly line. Exactly breach. You know, yeah. and, and, and in Drenith's case, Mean Betrayal. Uh, but that's it, and they have their deck is chocked full of answers to fucking Drenith anyway. So they just wait for the right time to remove it. In the meantime, you're hindered. They're drawing cards, right? It's you know they're not they're they don't care about stacks. They will swing a crom at whoever they need to all day long, and they don't care. Mm -hmm. So playing stacks pieces against Blue Farm, you should be very careful about when you're doing that and how you're doing that because you can, you know, you're just playing into their hands. So you know, mm -hmm. be aware and be careful. Um, yeah, Blue Farm is a deck that used to play a ton of Hate Bears because that used to be kind of their strategy was Hate Bears and Timna. And now they've leaned more into the proactive side of things in the average list and their current like efficient capabilities. But again, those Hate Bears don't really affect them. They can do what they want through them just fine. If you play the Dranith, they lean into the Ristic. If you play the Graph Digger's Cage, they can go for Thoracle or just set up a protected thing and then remove it. Like they have all the silence effects, the Grand Abolishers. They're, it's a very good deck full of good cards. Yes. And the only reason it works is because they're able to draw a lot of them. So the same way with Kinnon, you want to defeat their ability to make a lot of mana or utilize it. You want to take away TNK's ability to just draw a lot of cards. And I, I've, I've played a lot of Blue Farm. I played Blue Farm before I played Florian, frankly. And you know what happens when you don't draw cards in Blue Farm? Here's what happens, right? You have a hand full of excellent cards, like great cards, great cards, and you have half of a combo, and you never draw the other half, right? You just sit there, like you have, you know, you have the 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 Thassa's Oracle, but you don't have the Tainted Pact, and you don't have the Consultation, and you ain't gonna find it unless you're drawing cards, or you have the Breach, but you don't have enough cards in your graveyard, and you can't get enough cards into your graveyard because you're not drawing enough cards. Right, that's mm -hmm. and, and you that's what you beat. That's how you beat them. You strand them. You strand them with the wrong half of their deck. Um, you know, if you let them swing and let them draw, you you, <laughs> you know you're in big. And we trouble. understand everyone. Everyone can still win. You know, if you cut off Kinnon's mana, it still has ways to win. If you cut sure. off Blue Farm's ability to draw cards, it can still top deck well and win. We're not saying that it won't happen, but we're saying it's limiting the capabilities and increasing your own personal EV against that strategy. Yes. Yes. And the other thing is also don't let Blue Farm get away with sandbagging. Like force them to use their interact. My God. You know? Yeah. Because what Blue Farm would love to do, what they love to do, their favorite strategy is they want to sit on all that interaction, all that juicy interaction in their hand, protect their win attempt. Mm -hmm. Right. And they want you to do all the work. Don't let them do that. Force it on them. Like you, you're going to interact here. I'm going to pass priority. You just drew, you know, three cards off of off of Tim on your last turn. And you've got a, a Ristic study and you just drew two more cards. You have interaction. You answer this. This is your problem. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just refuse to interact. Yeah. And if they say, I don't have anything for this, say, reveal your hand. Yeah, show me. And then a lot, of, a lot of times, if they actually don't have interaction for it, you, they if they actually reveal their hand, which about a few people do, they just have a win in hand. And you're like, okay, so why would I stop this? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> 
yeah. then I can't stop you. Yeah, right? you have, you're sitting on a grand abolisher in a in a in a breach and you know yeah. and brain freeze in your hand. Like, why would I? Yeah, I'm not using my interaction here. I think that's it in terms of blue farm. Kind of it. Yeah, I'm actually curious to look at the look at the full stats just out of curiosity from the tournament I played in. Yeah, the top deck was Kinnon. <laughs> Docs. Six Kinnon, six Tivets, five Blue Farms, no more than two of anything else. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. But of, dude, of the six Kinnons, four made top 16. That's crazy. Wild. Wild. What tournament you got next? Wild. What's What are you planning on next? Um, so right now I'm deciding between there's going to be a private server one um that i'm in, that is an option for this weekend and then there's also a 2k in colorado springs i think i'm leaning towards going to the 2k yeah i would rather do that stuff even though i love you know yeah. the group of people you're talking about they're good people yeah it would be really fun it would be a really good event this weekend but the 2k is probably a better yeah money makes sense you know <laughs> you go for, for sure anyway i hope you guys enjoyed this uh you know i'll hand off all the all the all the last details to you as usual, Max. So you wanna you wanna take us out here? Thank you so much for listening to the Colors of Crutch podcast. My name is Max Sternberg, also known as Wounded Satellite. I was joined by one of the greatest fathers, men, friends, and partners to ever exist, Max P, the Floralian Man. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We are sponsored by TopDeck.gg, the best sponsors in the world. Down in the description below, you'll find links for our Patreon if you want to support the show even more. We've got lots of awesome tiers for you to check out. If you want to join the conversation outside of this YouTube, you can join our Discord. Description link is also in the description below. And if you're interested in CDH coaching, that is something that I offer and I've been doing a lot of lately and having a great time with. Uh, you can find me on Discord as Wounded Satellite or on Twitter as Wounded Satellite. Hit me up either of those to schedule a time. We appreciate you guys for listening and we look forward to talking to you next time. Bye.